Oh, <laughs> lovely. I love your background as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Katrina Fox. We're actually meeting for the first time, but you know, when you travel in the same circles, you feel like you know somebody even before you meet them. She is broadcasting live from Australia, and she is going to be talking about the business of veganism. Please welcome her to the show. It's nice to officially meet you. Lovely to officially meet you too, Chef AJ. And yeah, of course, you know, know you, you're very prolific and, you know, do incredible work. So I am so delighted to be here today. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, you're a longtime vegan too. Me, 44 years, you 25. So you're an OG too. I guess so. But then compared to you, not as. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as we were just saying off air though, before we came on, I mean, it's just so incredible to see the growth in this space and to see vegan uh, food and other products becoming, uh, you know, so much more accessible. Of course, we've still got a, you know, a way to go, but I, I'm so excited by the momentum because, you know, we were joking. I said, you know, 25 years ago, it was hard to be vegan. And then of course you came in and said, well, 44, you know, that's even more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very exciting time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because there's a, a special week going on in the raw food world. And I'm interviewing a lot of raw food chefs and they're doing demos. And for them, it's always easy to be vegan because <laughs> it's always been fruits and vegetables. Well, it's that funny, actually, my partner, Tracy, she is very, very, she's probably about 97% raw, but like, and I make this joke and she always tells me off, she say, don't, don't say it on air again, but I will. Um, she's a really boring raw vegan, like she will go to the fridge and pull out a piece of raw broccoli or raw cauliflower and just eat it. And I'm like, you can't be, you know, sharing that with people publicly, they'll think that's what being vegan is. But I know some incredible like raw food people who make the most amazing like cakes and, you know, all kinds of food so it's incredible I don't have the patience I'll be perfectly honest I'm not someone who spends a lot of time in the kitchen I will make a fresh fruit smoothie for breakfast and a salad for lunch and then after that I enjoy ready meals but healthy ones so I order from like plant-based meal delivery services that are made fresh so they are healthy but they arrive at my door and all I've got to do is heat them up so and I look at that as I'm supporting vegan businesses by doing that (laughs) absolutely you have that in Australia that's fabulous oh gosh yeah yeah we've got there's a few there's actually several um and yeah there's one particular one that I've got and there's a whole range of food so it means I get to eat delicious food that's very varied um, without having to you know do much myself which I enjoy because everybody's different you know if I I think sometimes when people say oh when you're you're vegan you know you've got to be good at cooking or you know you've got to spend a lot of time in the kitchen and I know people who love it and see it as creative and everything um, it's just not really my thing so I'm actually a really good lunch and dinner guest I love being fed (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, Mandy was Mandy said well what do you eat in a day so you eat the so this you, you have a food delivery from for, for yeah for so lunch first of all so very quick so when I get up in the morning I do make a fresh fruit smoothie with kale um freshly squeezed oranges strawberries or raspberries chia seeds hemp seeds and kale so that's a nice healthy start to the day I will then nibble on some raw cashew nuts sort of you know like late morning for my lunch I'll have just a very plain garden salad with a little bit of hummus so super healthy um then I might have an apple um and then my dinner will be one of the ready meals so that could be anything from uh, like it could be a pasta dish or it could be like something with brown rice like a, a casserole or a curry with brown rice um if I want a bit of a, a naughty treat you know it might be I don't know some uh, some kind of uh, plant-based meat with um mashed potato or something and some broccoli that's all done and all you have to do is like heat it up um but I love getting it from the plant-based meal delivery service because it hasn't been in a you know it hasn't got a really long life on it so even though I put it in the freezer it's not sometimes um it's not like gonna you know it's not one of those ones that's been made and then you know you can still eat it in a year's time it's made you put your order in and then it's made fresh that week um so yeah I do that and then I have homemade ice cream which is literally raspberries or strawberries and bananas I freeze them and then just put them in a blender and mix them up that's it don't even add any avocado some people add avocado for uh, extra creaminess but I don't and it's just beautiful healthy ice cream and I always make sure that we've got that in the freezer like I will spend a bit of time to make sure we've got that in the freezer and sometimes some cacao as well might add some uh, put some cacao in so it becomes like a chocolate ice cream um, and then that's it that's pretty much it unless I'm working really late then I might have a little bit of like maybe a great couple of grapes or maybe a tiny bit of um, vegan cheese but usually the vegan cheese is a weekend treat and again that's you know 
is something that I've made. Uh, not, it's not something that I've made, something that I've bought from a company. So that's my way of sharing, yeah, you know, um, helping and supporting vegan businesses. I can't believe I'm talking about food on because I don't you know because I don't do recipes or anything that's the first time I'm I'm speaking about food I'm like I make ice cream and I make fresh fruit smoothie whereas I'm sure you have amazing guests you know making incredible creations and here I am going well I make a fresh fruit smoothie but that's the thing though everybody's different and you know you you just kind of go with with what you you've got and fortunately now you know there are quite a lot of options um around that so it's great (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, I, I just, our, our viewers love to know what everyone eats. And we have a viewer watching Mandy from Australia. She says, where in Australia are you? And have you spoken at the Sydney Vegan Festival or other events there? Oh, oh yeah. Loads of times, Mandy. Hello. Yes, I'm in Sydney and um, I've spoken at um, Sydney Vegan Expo. There was a Sydney Vegan Festival where they used to have, that was a bigger one at like Marrickville um yeah quite a lot Melbourne um I've traveled you know around Australia and spoken as well as internationally so yeah I'm kind of and I've held events also for vegan entrepreneurs um haven't since COVID hit but um yeah we we had been doing some some meetups for vegan entrepreneurs but um and yeah and I'm online quite a lot so yeah I mean I would say sunny Sydney so it is sunny (laughs) some of the time and uh yeah really excited about you know I was talking about the plant-based meal delivery service it's just so great that there's you know uh quite a lot of those now that are you know most of them or some of them are shipping across Australia which is really exciting. Is Australia uh, becoming more vegan since you've lived there? Definitely like and that's what I think is actually really nice because I make a a joke because I'm from the UK originally and so when I left the UK we left here in 2000 I left in 2001 arrived in in Sydney in, in 2001 and um Basically, I've kind of watched the UK, like with Veganuary, like really go from strength to strength. They're bringing out all these amazing products. And I'm sitting there thinking, I can't believe it. I left the UK. And then all these amazing you know, products um, have come around. But it's been really nice, um, AJ, about being in Australia and actually seeing that happen and kind of, you know, helping to play, you know, a small part in that. It's actually quite quite nice just you know seeing the the uptake and I think of course that's a result of being online Um, you know social media of course you know we've sort of become a a global economy if you like and um, I think the benefits of that have been that you know Australia has seen you know and we tend to follow trends from America and the UK and so um, we're really starting to get there, particularly in plant-based meat. There's a lot happening in the plant-based meat space here in Australia. Um, some companies that have just really kind of come in, got a lot of funding and are really, uh, you know, making that happen. I think one of them's even started a plant-based um, factory, like manufacturing um, facility. So, yeah, we're really starting to, to get there. And it's really exciting seeing, uh, seeing that happen. Yeah, I love how you say about supporting, you like to support vegan businesses and so do I, but like, how do you know if a vegan is a vegan is business, a business is vegan? I mean, is there a directory? There should be because, you know, it was easier in LA because it seemed like there were more vegans. So when I went to a hairdresser, that was a prerequisite, but like when you live some other places, you can't always get a vegan veterinarian and a vegan doctor and a vegan hairdresser. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, again, I think with, you know, with, with people being online, you know, you can usually find something, but there are directories. There's typically, I don't know if there's an specifically an Australian vegan business directory. I know there was, but I'm not sure if there still is, but there are a lot of global ones and there's quite a lot. Um, so it's, and then you can join groups um, as well on Facebook, like often, you know, in groups, someone will say, oh, I'm looking for, you know, a vegan hairdresser in whatever city and people will give all kinds of recommendations. So I think it is quite easy to, to find um, and obviously vegan restaurants you know you can uh, find those um, online but yeah if you're looking for, for other services and other businesses um, you know that it's pretty easy to find now with um, yeah through online through some of the directories and of course some of the, the Facebook groups and so on so that's great. what made you decide to go vegan 25 years ago um, well I went veg- vegetarian without knowing it when I was 11 when I asked my mom what's the burger what's the beef burger made out of and when she said it was a cow and I realized it was a living uh, animal or being I was horrified and then I quickly realized the fish fingers were made of fish and we had goldfish you know as pet and chicken on Sundays the roast chicken I was like oh my gosh um, because I'd had a real affinity with my cat Kitty I think Kitty was one of my best friends as a, a child and I, I I made made that connection even though I didn't grow up in the country I went there in the summer to stay with a cousin for a few weeks and I would just go and hang out with cows you know and give them apples and and so I was just horrified so I just said I'm not eating animals which didn't 
didn't go down too well. Um, and funnily enough, this would have been about 1977, which is probably about the time I think you said you were going vegan. Um, and so, yeah, I was 11, went, went vegetarian without knowing the word. But it took um, quite a long, long time later to understand about dairy. Um, it took until 1996. So the very quick story is I was actually on an animal rights demo. I was going on a, uh, a national demo. So I was on a coach or a bus, I think you call them in the US, um, going to protest uh, into the town of Oxford to protest about a nearby vivisection uh, facility that was breeding kit, a farm that was breeding kittens for vivisection. And I pulled out my sandwich. I was sat next to a lovely school teacher on the bus. And I said, oh, would you like um, a Marmite and cheese sandwich? Marmite's like a savory spread. And she said, oh, no, I'm vegan. I don't eat cheese. I said, oh, it's vegetarian cheese. There's no animal rennet in it. I was very pleased with myself. And then she explained about the dairy industry. And I was horrified because I'd been involved in the feminist movement, you know, so very much, um, you know, believe in bodily autonomy for, for everyone, you know, women's reproductive rights. So to actually find out, you know, to have that myth shattered that, you know, you've seen all these adverts on TV for, you know, cream cheese and stuff about happy cows willingly giving their milk. And when I realized I was like I was actually annoyed with myself if I'm really honest I felt guilty I thought how did I not know this I thought I was, I was wearing leather I was still wearing leather shoes as well at that time I thought how did I not know this so the penny dropped I sent off for my little guide it was a paperback guide from the vegan society it was called the vegan animal free shopper I think it was called so then when I went shopping and it took me it, at that time, it took me like twice as long because I was going through my guide, looking up the ingredients. But I was one of those people that pretty much went vegan straight away. I mean, obviously, you know, phasing out the food and certain furniture took a little bit longer. But like once I knew I was like, that's it, um, I'm done. And and it wasn't easy at the time because, you know, we used to love eating cheese um, and I liked, you know, certain chocolate and things. So I was just like, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do it. So for me, it's always been about the animals. And to be honest, because I know your, your show is often about quite a lot about healthy eating in the beginning I was a bit of a junk food vegan like I would just be eating I like right what biscuits and cakes can I still eat that don't have animal products in but then you know once I kind of went uh, along a bit further the and particularly when Tracy my partner went vegan she started looking into the health aspects um so then they became a bonus the health and the environment aspects became a bonus but I always say it's one of the best things I did and like many vegans I think we all wish we'd done it sooner <laughs> Yeah, I've only been a healthy vegan for less than 20 years because the first 26, I was <laughs> only. Vegan all the way and I, I ended up with very poor health. And so, you know, I, that's that's why I, I am so much more health oriented now. But at the end of the day, I'd rather have somebody be a junk food vegan than a healthy carnivore. If that yeah, is. yeah. Well, yeah, it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It's so funny. Uh, Mandy, who's from Australia, pointed out that it's Aussie Day on Chef AJ Live because my last guest was also, I mean, I didn't plan it that way, but heck, oh. that's why we're doing later shows to accommodate all the different time zones. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. You, you told a great story. I was listening to an interview you did, which, because so many people say, well, you know, I'd be vegan except for the cheese or, or fill in the blank. And you told a funny story about a Twix bar, which, by the way, I used to love those as well crunchy, creamy, chocolatey, caramely. Yeah. So, yeah. So when you go vegan or when you went vegan 25 years ago, it was like, right, what can I still eat? And I came to the realization, well, one, I can't have pizza with cheese anymore. And that was quite, you know, upsetting, but I thought, well, it is what it is. But one of the things I loved was a Twix bar. And I don't know if they're the same in America as a British Twix bar, but they're kind of like two chocolate things with caramel inside and chocolate over the top and a cookie. And and it's, a cookie. it's got a little crunchy cookie yeah yeah yep. like a thing and um and I I really love them and I one day I stopped at the petrol station gas station call them in the US to fill up the car and I went into the counter you know when you go to pay at the counter they tend to have an array of confectionery you know to tempt you to to buy something ad hoc and there was a twix and I thought oh god I'd love a twix I miss a twix and what I did in my mind's eye I saw cow with mastitis you know inflamed um uh, others um you know crying for her baby who'd been stolen I remembered that you know that a little bit of blood and infected pus is allowed in milk but it was more the ethical side like I saw and I heard a cow in my mouth mooing a mother cow and I just thought no so and then I, I I turned the twix around so I no longer missed it it actually became something that I wouldn't dream of, of having anymore so I kind of very quickly disassociated those original feelings of all oh, Twix yummy uh, to something that's like, oh my gosh, absolutely no. You know what I mean? So it became easy in the future 
to you know to not want it um but as i've said i would love for someone to do a vegan version of a twix you know you give me a vegan version i will taste test it for you and be a customer so yeah but i also realize aj that not everyone is like that like for me because i came i guess from the animal side of things um you know it i did it i was prepared to do it i was prepared to make at those time at that time 25 years ago what you might call a sacrifice but I think nowadays and this is why I'm so passionate about more you know supporting businesses um, um, vegan businesses and businesses going vegan uh, to make sure that we we can make it as easy as possible for people who you know family for example might be a busy person with a family who's just got to run around and do their shopping uh, you know what I mean they just you know, need to buy whatever, we need to make it easy so that when they can just reach off the shelf and choose the vegan option um, of, you know, what might have been one of their favourite foods or one of their kids' favourite foods. So I, I feel very passionately about we do need to um, make things as accessible, both financially affordable and also available in as many places as possible um, so that more people have access um, to vegan and plant-based foods. Well, while you were talking, I quickly Googled vegan Twix and I found three recipes. So I'm going to send them to you, but I don't, I know you want to know. I won't what- make them though. I need someone to make them. <laughs> but at least, at least they exist. They least. exist. It's very true. Very true. If anyone would like to make me a Twix and mail it to me, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> because there, there's a lot of candy bars now that they're making vegan that were tr- like, you know, that, that were traditionally with dairy and things. That, so I'm, I'm wondering why nobody uh, tried to do the Twix. I don't know, but maybe look, I feel if we put it out into the ether, then maybe someone will hear it and it will, it will come along. <laughs> I'll wait. I've waited 25 years. I can wait a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're very patient. So t- tell me about your podcast. Um, well, I've got two, but the, the one that's been running the longest is um, Vegan Business Talk. Um, so I started that back in 2016, and it's had a couple of hiatuses. Um, but I started it mainly because I just published my book, Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. And I'd interviewed um, over 60 vegan entrepreneurs from across the globe, asking them about their challenges and their strategies for success. And then when the book came out, and, you know, because I'm a journalist, so I'm, you know, I'm used to interviewing people. I love interviewing people because I, I love to know people's stories. I love to share people's stories. And I thought, oh, I miss interviewing people because I like, you know, been go, go, go doing interviews. And I thought, oh, I miss doing these interviews. I thought, I know, I'll start a podcast. So I'd love to say there was some really kind of smart business idea behind it. But really, it was a case of that would be a fun thing to do. Um, So, yeah, I basically um, started it. And I it's really it's almost like a free training, essentially. I mean, a lot of people say that, that they enjoy it so much because it is very practical. So. I interview vegan business owners and entrepreneurs and I find out, you know, why they started the business, how they started it, um, you know, how it's funded. People always want to know that. What marketing strategies that do they use that have been uh, successful, what their challenges are, how they've overcome them. And depending on the business, if it's a food business, I might ask them, you know, if they've got into a big supermarket chain, for example, how did they do that? Talking through. So it's, you know, it's really to kind of help anyone, um, either other existing vegan business owners or anyone who wants to start a vegan business <clears throat> to really kind of get, give them an insight into uh, to what it's lo- what it's really like so to inspire them but also to give them you know a reality check as well about and to help them avoid some of the pitfalls um you know i think running a business of any kind is challenging and you know you're going to make mistakes there's going to be failures that's all part of the learning curve but i think if you can be as best equipped as possible to avoid uh you know some of those uh, pitfalls then that's what the aim of business vegan business talk is yeah do you have the show shark tank in australia yeah we've got an um australian version um to be honest i I haven't really watched it i actually i quite like the the us one but my favorite is actually dragon's den which is the british one for some reason i really like dragon's den out of all of them but yes we do the reason I ask this is because there have been a lot of vegan products, you know, the uh, Unreal Deli, for example. Uh, yes, the, I've interviewed they, her. They yeah. spread, so co- there's been a, quite a few vegan products that came out of that show. Well, I tell you what's really good about those shows is that um, some of the, well, the sharks or in the UK, the dragons, as they're called, are becoming much more open to vegan products, whereas in the past they might have just 
poo-pooed them and said, oh, no, that won't sell. But now they're literally fighting over themselves um, to, to get a deal. And I think Mark Cuban, I think, I believe, has become vegetarian. So he's invested, uh, you know, very heavily in some products. Uh, Deborah Meaden, who's the dragon on Dragon's Den, she's very into sustainability. She announced she's vegan. And then she kind of clarified on Twitter that she's actually plant-based. Um, but, you know, because I think they've got rescue hens. And so she eats some of the eggs from the rescue hens. But otherwise, you know, she's not eating animals. And for some, you know, for, for that to, to happen on those kind of shows, I, I think is uh, is fabulous because they're so popular. And it's basically, you know, especially when you've got people like that who haven't been vegan all the time going, oh, my gosh, this is delicious. You know, if it's food or this is amazing, this is a wonderful product and they're throwing money at it. What that then says to people is, oh, OK, well, maybe vegan products aren't boring or, you know, bland or all of this. So I think it really helps to, to change the psyche of, um, you know, the population and to dispel a lot of those myths around, you know, vegan products and plant-based products. So yeah, I think it's fantastic. Well, I'm glad you're sitting down because I have something to say to you from Mandy in Australia in the chat. Are you familiar with Cole's Supermarket? Of course, yes. <laughs> well, Mandy, who is a vegan, actually a raw vegan, says they carry a vegan Twix bar. No. Are you sure, Mandy? Oh, can you put a link to it, like the name of it? I'm going to have to, re as soon as I get off here, I'm going to be researching hey, that. Mandy, you, my did you find a link to it? In, in, uh, <laughs> in, yeah, because, I mean, she's saying there is. I mean, why? Really? Isn't that wow. amazing? Yeah. How many, so how many people now have you interviewed for your podcast approximately? Well, the number of episodes, I think we're only at perhaps about 172, I think. Um, some of those, some of the earlier ones, I'd say maybe the first 20 were interviews that I'd done for the book, and then I repurposed them for the show. Um, and then the rest are all um, original ones. So yeah, probably about 150 um, for, for Vegan Business Talk. Yeah. Any any memorable ones that stick out in your mind? You're my, you're my 709th. Wow. So, when ask me, <laughs> You're it's amazing. Not, it's not that I don't remember, but man, when you get into those numbers, it's it's like when somebody says, well, who, who was the vegan orthopedic doctor? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know that I know that I, it's Patrick Olson, by the way, but but I mean, you know, sometimes you're like, well, I know I interviewed one. So <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. I mean, gosh, we just stop for a minute and say congratulations to you. I mean, that is a feat in and of itself. As I say, I've had a couple of hiatuses with mine. It started weekly, um, and then it went monthly. Then there was a pause, and now at the moment it's fortnightly, uh, which is every two weeks. I know sometimes in America don't know what fortnight is so I just explain because um, I know this is going out globally um, and some of the most memorable interviews gosh there's been so many I would say I mean I really enjoyed again this was an interview for the book but I really enjoyed interviewing Seth Tibbet from Tofurky because he had such an incredible story like of really hanging on in there for years and years and years without um, you know, much business, initial business success, living in a tree house to save on rent. I mean, that's so memorable. I know uh, Seth has got his own book um, uh, memoir out, so I highly recommend people read that. But that really stuck out to me because then, you know, Tofurky did hit the big time. Um, and what I remember as well that he said is that he initially tried to fit into like being quite corporate and conservative. And he said, it just wasn't me. And when he just was completely himself, you know, that kind of infused into the brand, it added a bit of color, a bit of humor, a bit of fun into the brand. And that he said, that's what partly what's made, made it so successful. So I thought that was a really good piece of business advice. Cause I think sometimes when people go into starting a vegan business, some people go to it from an activist side um, or even a traditional business side. And they feel like, Oh, now I'm in the quote business world. Um, um, you know, I've got to wear, you know, be a bit bland and tone everything down. And I love what Seth said about, look, you know, you, you just need to be yourself. You know, I love a bit of sparkle, as you can see, I've got a bit of sparkly jacket on today. I love a bit of sparkle, a bit of bling. And um, I think it's important, you know, you can bring those elements to business. So I'd say Seth is probably one of the, uh, the most memorable ones. Um, yeah. Uh, but there have been a lot. So <laughs> and I always in, in enjoy interviewing people. I always get something from someone. And I think they, you know, that everyone shares something um, helpful because everyone's got even if they're running the same businesses, because sometimes I've interviewed people in similar sectors, you know, like maybe it's a cookie brand where obviously I'm obviously focused now that we're talking about Twix. I'm, I've got cookies on the brain, but say it was, you know, I, I might have interviewed two or three uh, cookie brands, but they've all got their different stories um, and and journeys, which I think is really um, been helpful and exciting. So I, I love it. 
Well, aren't you glad, you know, this is funny, uh, Katrina, because you, you, I can't do this for you because they won't ship to Australia, but every guest that comes on my show the first time gets two free bottles of balsamic vinegar, and I can't really send that to you. But <laughs> now what I am going to send to you after the show is I did find the vegan Twix in Australia. You can also get it at Woolworths, and I'm going to send you that link. And it's also gluten-free as well as vegan. Well, I should be going to, well, I should be going around this weekend to my local Coles to see if they've got it. See if I have <laughs> getting on my bike and sign cling to find the nearest one <laughs> if i hadn't listened to that interview with you i would never even know to go down i know thank you so much mandy so yeah you, thank I, you mandy <laughs> you know, yeah, when i was looking up the fun facts for you 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 met quite a few celebrities back in the day lauren bacall sophia loren how did that come to be well lauren bacall was i was 18 i was about 18 or 19 and i'd um I was obsessed with when I was growing up, you know, even my, my early to mid teens, I was obsessed with golden age Hollywood, you know, Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, Barbara Stanley, all of that. I thought they were so glamorous. And because I was living in a small town, I basically wanted to get out. And I saw I saw that as a life outside, you know, the small town that I lived in. Anyway, so I bought a ticket to see Lauren Bacall in a Tennessee Williams play, Sweet Bird of Youth. I went up, watched the show. And as soon as it was finished, when people were clapping, I raced down um, to the stage door um, to meet her and basically she came and I thought there'd be loads of people there and there wasn't and she came out and I just said oh thank you Mid. lovely lovely to meet you Miss Bacall and I think she signed my program and then she very quickly got into a car so I got a photo like I took a photo with my old camera you know back in the day um but you can't really see it so like it was hurdless like getting in a in a car but you can't really tell it's Lauren Bacall but it is but that's how I met her but then um over the years it's mainly been through my journalism work so I worked quite a lot for the LGBTIQ um, media um, particularly here in Sydney back in about 2000 anywhere between 2004 to 2008 so then I did get to um, interview people like Olympia Dukakis Martina Navratilova um Sophia Loren I think I've got all my fun facts who I I managed to shock when I went to a press conference for an Italian film festival and asked her what her views are on same-sex marriage and she looked very shocked and she said I don't want to talk about that I just want to talk about films darling <laughs> which is that's quite funny great. that's great that's a great voice and, and you know when I think of Lauren McCall it's her voice that I loved so much even yet as beautiful as she was she had such an amazing voice yeah yeah so I was very excited about that and then I've met Jackie Collins um, who I interviewed I was very starstruck with that because I used to read her books when I was about 13 or 14 and she was terribly glamorous and I interviewed her in a hotel very posh hotel here in Sydney um so I was quite starstruck for that one um and also I met Joan Collins who I was also a big fan of so I used to love to watch Dynasty um so yeah I've been quite fortunate you know to uh yeah, to meet a few celebrities or, or interview them. Dionne Warwick, um, or oh, blood bless her, she, she really did not want to be do interviews. I think she was really tired and it was so hard getting questions out of her. Um, in fact, the publicist rang up and said, how was it? I said, look, it was pretty awful. I said, she could, I could hardly get anything out of her. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, she's just really busy. And I just thought, you know what? Because a lot of journalists would have just written like a quite an acidic piece and sort of weave that in. But I thought, you know what? She's a legend. She's tired. So I kind of I put what little quote she did with me. I weaved them in um, and I wrote a really nice piece and I got a free ticket to see her show. So I, and she was brilliant. So I, was, I forgave her. <laughs> You did some acting yourself, didn't you? Back in yeah, the day? yeah, my degree is actually in performance art, um, which I, I did. And then I kind of did some fringe stuff, um, you know, back in the, I've kind of done on and off things with with performing. So I did, you know, some some fringe kind of stuff, a bit of extra work, you know, where you're in the back background um, of, of some stuff in the UK, like shows like The Bill and so on. Um, then I moved into journalism from the mid 90s. And then about 2006, 2007, um, I wrote a one woman show. I did some character. I did some stand up comedy um, and I created a, um, a character comedy show called Kitty Minge, Good Time Girl in a Big Bad World. And I managed to weave veganism and she was quite a bawdy sort of character, but I managed to weave in you know issues around veganism and stuff and that looked like it was taking off like I got an agent um but I got really burnt out so it was at the time I did this show it was on at Mardi Gras I'd also written a, a small play for a, um, a pink shorts it was called like a short um LGBTIQ 
play festival and I was working at the queer press so I was rushing around going everywhere because during Mardi Gras when you're writing for the gay media uh, it's really full on so I ended up getting really burnt out and I lost my voice so this agent was like uh, messaging me saying oh, we've got you this job to go and I think it was to entertain people on a bus or something and I just said look I can't do it and after I'd done that I was kind of burnt out and I thought you know what I've ticked those goals you know I'd written and performed a one-woman show before I was 40 and I just kind of moved away from it so I can be a little bit fickle with it like when I get the bug I, I go with it and then but when I don't I, I don't so there's there's that element in it but I like to think I've used the skills um, to you know to speak to interview people uh, you know I enjoy doing that kind of thing and, and I would never say never so you never know I might I do something along those lines again we'll see <laughs> do you like to interview better or to be interviewed oh gosh I like both actually I like both I mean obviously I like interviewing people because I can tease things out of them uh, you know if they say something interesting then I, I like to be able to to tease that out of them uh, but I'm, I'm quite happy being interviewed myself as well I enjoy being on both sides I think what was the award that you won for your show um, I won an award for my journalism. Um, so I wrote an article for the ABC, um, which is uh, like the main um, public broadcaster here in Australia. And they had a website and it was in a, they had an opinion section called The Drum at the time. And I wrote an article about speciesism. I think I called it Speciesism, the Final Frontier. And um, at that time, there's a quite a well-known animal protection organization here called Voiceless. And they would give these media awards out. And I would attend them quite a lot you know over the years and I think and I knew the people around them and I and I always you know would say to people like you know I don't want them. even though I was nominated I would always say I don't want an award because I want them to give them to the mainstream media journalists who are not vegans who are not animal activists because then they'll be happy and then they'll write about these issues even more but I think it was one of the last times that they held these media awards and I won the award for um, online and print journalism um, which was very nice, very exciting. And um, it came with a cash prize, which helped me to publish my book, Vegan Ventures. So I think the timing was right. And it was, yeah, it was just, it was very nice. <laughs> and Thomas, who's watching live, wants to know, do you have groups or classes for vegan entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, so on uh, veganbusinessmedia.com, I've got a lot of free stuff on there. So there's blog posts and as mentioned, there's the podcasts. Um, so that's all available for free. Um, and then I either do one-on-one -on -one consultations or I've also got a course called um, Vegans in the Limelight, which is an online PR course for vegan entrepreneurs. So that's because my background is journalism. So that teaches you everything you need to know to do your own publicity. Because I know with a lot of vegan businesses, particularly when you're starting out, you can't afford to hire a publicist or a PR firm because you know that's several thousand dollars a month not everyone's got that budget but I don't want people to miss out on getting into the media because it's not rocket science it is a, uh, something that you can you you can learn um so yeah that's what I cover in vegans in the limelight it teaches you everything you need to know um, about how to do your own PR and it also comes with 12 months support from me so um, you can show me your proposed pitches or media releases and I give you feedback before you send them uh, to journalists so that's quite an, an affordable way way to work with me and to be able to yeah become your own publicist or train someone if you've got a VA a virtual assistant um, to train them how to do it so yeah that thanks for asking um, and that's on veganbusinessmedia.com you can find all of that Great. and I put all the links that you gave me they're right below this video oh awesome thank you so that, that's good so are more are there people that have vegan products that aren't vegan even yeah Absolutely. And this is it's quite funny, actually, because it's easy how you can make assumptions. So um, sometimes when I was when I reach out to do interviews, I kind of assume that if you've got a vegan business, you'll be vegan yourself. But that's not the case now. And in a way, I, I initially I was kind of like, oh, um, but I'm actually quite glad because I think it shows that a lot of like businesses now they're making their even though the owners or the founders or whatever may not necessarily be vegan themselves but they're recognizing that it's a smart thing to do to make their products vegan by default so now because I get pitched a lot for vegan business talk the majority of the time it's not me reaching out to, um, I'm getting pitched by a publicist you know to say oh you know that we've got this this person and their their company and the products are all vegan and it turns out that they're not vegan themselves so it's kind of interesting because initially I kind of think oh but then I think well okay what well, what you know what I mean far better that they this person because this person was obviously going to start their business anyway and 
and not make it vegan at least they've gone you know gone to the trouble of by default making them vegan you'll also see some celebrities who are not necessarily vegan themselves coming out with say a makeup range and just by default they're making it vegan because it's a smart business choice and it makes the product more accessible um, so even though that person necessarily isn't uh, vegan themselves that it makes their their products much more um, you know marketable they get a, a bigger range of people to to buy them so it's an interesting one. this is what I mean about I think in the past when you had you know if people were running a vegan business they probably were vegan but now that it's you know exploded um, a lot of people are, are getting in um, on the action on the bandwagon if you like so yeah interesting times you know it's interesting because I mean like I will support a vegan product, even if the owner's not vegan. You know, I'm not an abolitionist in that way because you never know. Like, I'll give you an example. A while back, I met a man who has a spice company, Nick DeVorn and his wife, Evelyn. It's in Tiburon, California, and in Marysville. And I met him because I was wanting to have a spice that tasted like pepperoni pizza, but obviously was vegan, but didn't have salt, oil, or sugar. And that's how we met. And he sent me a sample and we got to know him. And, you know, I mean, obviously the spices are vegan. There's nothing he sells that isn't vegan. He himself wasn't vegan. But what happened is I started having him at my conferences and then we never allowed selling during when the doctors were speaking. We thought that was kind of disrespectful to have the vendors be selling. So he would come in the room and he would listen. And if he's not 100% vegan now, he's pretty darn close. You know, but if I had just closed that door, like, oh, well, you know, you're not vegan, so I'm not going to buy your stuff. You know, you can, you can make people, not make people vegan, but expose them to it through <laughs> buying their products that are vegan, even if they're not vegan. Absolutely, for, for sure. And I, 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 I've, you know, seen that happen as well, you know, just with companies kind of going, oh, that's interesting. And then they, they open the conversation. Um, you know, and I've had like, you know, people say, oh, yeah, my, my wife's been looking at, um, you know, moving to more towards veganism, uh, for example. So you just never know. Like my I have a chiropractor who's very like literally five minute walk. He's not vegan, but he's very open to it. So he's constantly asking me questions like during the treatment, you know, about it. And sometimes I might bring him something, you know, if I get sent something like, you know, I think Beyond sent me some burgers uh, quite uh, yeah and I had I'd been to a press launch I think it was not beyond it was um one of the plant-based meat companies here in Australia and I'd been to their media launch and they sent me a load of stuff and I thought I can't fit it all in the freezer so I took it to him and you know now he's saying oh yeah at least twice a week now we're having completely vegan meals and do you know what I mean they're just he's on a bit of a journey and um you know, there isn't a local vegan chiropractor. If there was one across the road, I'd probably go there. But, you know, he's convenient, he's there, and he's open to talking. And you just never know when people will switch. I mean, I'm sure you and I both know, what's he called? Howard Lyman, you know, the big dairy um, uh, uh, farmer, and beef farmer. Um, you never know when people are going to switch. The most unlikely of people um, can, can make that change. And it might not be straight away, but you're definitely planting seeds. You know, it's interesting because I can understand why somebody who's not vegan would want to sell a vegan product because you're in business to, to make money. What always has confounded me, though, is when somebody is vegan and then they sell a non-vegan product. Do you know what I'm saying? And that those people exist. Yeah. Like I could, I'm not going to mention the person the same. I'm sure. You <laughs> but um, I, well, actually, I knew him in L.A. And uh, I know who you mean, I think. Yeah, <laughs> well, this guy is, you know, I'm when I lived in L.A., I lived in an apartment building. And when you live in an apartment building, they exterminate once a month a company. I, I don't have a choice. I mean, I can move, but yeah, I can't. Yeah. I, I mean, they're not coming in my apartment. You know, they they do the perimeter of the sure. apartment building. And as it turned out, the man that owned this company was vegan. And I'm like, God, that is uh, so interesting. I mean, you're vegan and this is your job. And, wow. You know, and then there are some vegan, uh, vegans that still you know, like they'll have restaurants that sell animal products and stuff. So that must be some cognitive distance for them, unless they're just vegan for health and don't care about the animals. That's true. And then it's more plant-based to health. But yeah, look, that is an interesting one because but just on the, the, the extermination thing, there's actually a fabulous company in the UK run by Kevin Newell. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It's Humane something solutions oh that's awful like he's in my book I should know and I'm interested but he's really going off that and he's like oh, does the whole um you know so-called pest solutions in a completely humane way and he's awesome so I hope that's an area that will be growing but yeah like I know someone as well who I think what happens is sometimes when people have that a business then they go vegan 
Um, and then I can understand that they might not want to, you know, com completely veganize their business straight away because it's like, you know, they've got this business going and now to just veganize it. But, you know, I do know people that have done that. There was, I interviewed a couple, um, a young woman um, in Canada who um, had a health food shop and then she's completely veganized it. And, you know, some customers didn't like it and said, I'm not coming anymore, but it's actually worked out, you know, quite well in the end. So I, I think there's, there's that to consider, but yeah, it is kind of, kind of interesting um yeah well, I think it's it, it, where you've got someone yeah who's vegan and the product is not vegan you it, yeah. it, it is a bit of a disconnect right? but I think every case is different and I, I you know I try not to judge because you right. know you you've got to kind of make smart decisions but ultimately uh like I do know uh, I think I know someone I, I can't remember them but they they all they were vegan and then running a business that wasn't fully vegan but then now that the timing has become right they have made the switch so I think it's all kind of yeah different different scenarios but yeah it is a bit a little bit or weird that way around. like you know actors that are vegan and still do commercials for non-vegan products that that's yeah I've noticed but no I'm not judging either I'm just saying it's interesting because like for yeah, me I like yeah. to live in a state of cognitive dissonance because it drives me crazy but to each his own I would love for you to introduce me to the humane exterminator if you will <laughs> yes a wonderful topic. yeah Just definitely because I think he does consult like obviously he works in the UK so physically goes to UK stuff but I think he does do international um consults I know his name's Kevin Newell and I'm so I feel terrible like the name of it's something it's definitely humane something solutions I think maybe he'd oh, be God. on the show because this is something that people are very interested yeah in. yeah absolutely, absolutely. Don't, so don't. if you're listening yeah. Kevin so sorry I can't remember the exact <laughs> name of the company but I've said Kevin's name which is good oh. uh, but we can easily find it and I'll, I'll, I can do an intro for sure <laughs> so Sherry who's watching live says does Katrina think vegan businesses are more successful when marketed towards a certain age or sex or liberal versus conservative demographic and why Oh, that's a good question. Um, so there's a couple of things here. I think back in the day when you had a vegan business, you, the majority of your customers were vegan or vegetarian. Now that's all changed. So if you're starting a business now, you're running a business now to only market to vegans or vegetarians is a very small part of the population. So what we're seeing happening now is that a lot of vegan businesses are marketing to what's called flexitarian so these are people who are plant curious so they want to cut down on their meat you know they're recognizing that it's bad for the environment or maybe for their health and even to some degree um, you know for animal welfare reasons but they're not ready to you know completely go vegan and you know eliminate absolutely everything and they're by far the, the bigger market so how you market a business is it really does depend on on your demographics and on your own message so I'll give you an example you've got beyond meat so beyond meat which I think a lot of people know they deliberately use the word plant-based they don't use vegan I think they might have it in small letters on the back just so that vegans know about it but they don't really lead with vegan whereas you've got uh, and they say they deliberately say look our, our product is for you know the flexitarian market they want to make it mainstream for, for everyone then you've got Miyoko Shinna um, who's got Miyoko's with her amazing cheeses she very much leads with vegan she's got a vegan tattoo on her arm she's got a vegan all over the, the packaging because she wants to you know demystify that um you know vegan at the word vegan and um both of them are catering to obviously uh, vegans or vegetarians buy their products, but also the, the mainstream market is, is also buying them. In terms of your question about liberal versus conservative, I won't name any names, but there was the situation, for example, in Australia, I'm going to keep this as vague as possible, where a person who owned, a, they turned their cafe vegan so it was all great everyone was going that was awesome and then on their personal page they started posting about trump in a positive way like trump supporter and then a vegan got a whiff of that posted that in the group and basically the owner of the cafe using their business name went in and started just like really kind of going off it got really full on and in the end the person closed their business down because there was a lot of publicity around it and it was all just a bit full on so in terms of you know your politics I think it's a an individual choice as to how much you put out there in public um, so some vegan businesses will quite deliberately state um, you know that they are vegan um, because they want to make a difference in the world and 
you know, they might post, for example, something about Black Lives Matter, their support for Black Lives Matter. They might post, um, you know, if it's Pride Month in June, they might, you know, put a thing saying, you know, we celebrate and support LGBTIQ customers, etc. Um, and others don't. So there might be others that, I don't know, that are a bit more conservative. And at the end of the day, I think you have to make that choice yourself um, and be comfortable with that. Um it is a, a tricky one because I think sometimes, you know, particularly in vegan activist circles, it's kind of like, well, how can you be a Republican and be vegan? Do you know what I mean? You can get into all that kind of, um, you know, messy, kind of, you know, political discussions. I think people are not, you know, it, it, people are nuanced. And I think um, that can often get lost on social media. So I guess what I would say is just be prepared that if you do take a stand on one thing, there's going to be people who aren't going to be happy with that. But at the end of the day, you can't please everyone. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, I support businesses and I want businesses to be inclusive, uh, et cetera. But it can be a little bit. It's a bit like, you know, they say around the dinner table, you know, be careful talking about religion, politics and, and stuff. So I think you have to make that decision for yourself, but just be prepared um, that, you know, you, you're not going to please everyone and you can't please everyone. It's a bit like when you produce your products, if you make a food product, not everyone's going to love it. And I think sometimes vegan businesses, it feels like someone's attacking your baby <laughs> you know to me because it's your, your product, but it might just not be like, I'll give you an example. I do not like salt and sweet together. Do not give me salted caramel. I just don't like it. It doesn't matter that it's vegan and it's the most wonderful company. I just don't like the taste of it. That doesn't mean your product is wrong. Some people love it and it's awesome, but not everyone will. So I hope I've kind of answered your, your question, but it's, uh, it, it can be a bit of a minefield, particularly um, online. Well, Sherry says, thank you for answering my question. It sounds like Katrina thinks vegan businesses might be safer or more successful if they cater to more of a liberal slant. It depends where you are. I mean, I hate to say, I mean, obviously I want to encourage that. Um, but look, if your business is, I don't know, there's certain states in America where, you know, the people have a different view. If you've got a restaurant smack bang in the middle of that, um, who, who knows, may, maybe not. But I, obviously I, you know, encourage businesses to be uh, inclusive and, and welcoming of all. But um, it, it really depends, yeah, who you are and, and where you are um, and, and what you want to put out there. I just want to thank Mandy M, fellow Aussie, who found you the Twix bar for her super chat donation. You said <laughs> for accidental Aussie day. Do you find that more people that aren't vegan are becoming more interested in vegan products and services, even if they are not vegan themselves? Yeah, definitely. Funnily enough, I was actually at a oh when was this? It was probably a good few months ago now because we've been, been at the time of this interview. We've been in lockdown for about three months, but earlier this year, I was invited to an event. Um, it was like a tasting event and we were around the table and there was a, a, a woman there. She was actually vegetarian. So she was already kind of partly uh, along the way. And um, we started talking about you know, veganism and she said, oh, she said, I, I, I just really like cheese. And I said, oh, I said, well, there's so many vegan cheeses now. And she said, really? I said, oh, yeah. And I rattled off, you know, some of them. And she was like, oh, wow. And then I told her about the vegan grocery store, which is run by my friend Jess in Sydney. And she was like, oh, and I said, they've got like, you know, whole fridge fulls of all these different vegan cheeses. And she was like, oh, that's fascinating. She said, oh, I didn't know that. I've had other people, you know, say that as well, who, you know, they're, they're just like, I, po I think I posted, I had a, um, a burger, a cheeseburger from a, a, a all vegan um, burger joint. And I posted a picture of it and they said, well, how can that be vegan? It's got cheese in it. And I, I'm like, yeah, there's these vegan cheeses. So I'm finding people are really curious, like, well, where can I buy them? What do they taste like? Um, you know what I mean? So I think definitely yeah, people are more um, curious about it. It's become less of a, a stigma uh, in many ways. We're still not there yet, but, you know, it's, uh, I think people genuinely are more curious and they're more open to trying uh, these products because, you know, and I think, you know, companies like Beyond and, and that have done quite a good thing in that regard in that you know and I'm sure you know this AJ from being vegan as long as you have we've all eaten those kind of dry kind of lentil burgers that sort of pass off as you know uh, a burger whereas now that people are seeing well look I don't actually have to give up any of my favorite foods you know I can have a steak and, and I know I'm not talking healthy here sorry but you know what I mean but I'm just talking about people who you know are not there yet you know if they they think oh I can have a steak and chips and it's not going to taste like cardboard um, you know what I mean so I think yeah people are a lot more open they're a lot more curious now for both their health reasons environmental um, 
um, animal reasons as well. I think people are a lot more open now. Um, and the best way, I think, particularly with food, the best way to get people over the line is to feed them, you know, to give them, uh, you know, let them taste these these products and um yeah get get them on the on the right path shall we say on the best path <laughs> how important is location like i'm just wondering if there's certain places that a vegan business just may not fly like uh i don't know the deep south for example i mean i'm sure there are some things but are are there places that i mean we always know you know la new york but are there places where like you shouldn't even try to open a vegan business you know, it's an interesting one because I, I do have to recognize I am a city girl. So, you know, I've, lived, I've come from London to Sydney, you know, I visit New York, LA, like you say, and it is quote easier, I think, to open a vegan business where, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of the, particularly if it's a physical business where people, you know, if it's a restaurant, for example, where people are physically going to come into your restaurant. So either from a tourism point of view or the local area, um, you know, that that obviously is a factor. But funny enough, you, you'd be surprised. Um, and obviously, you know, we do want to see places further afield so that veganism isn't just seen as some trendy in a city thing that hipsters can take advantage of. Um, but like I, I interviewed someone and I can't remember their name again, but they opened, I think it was like a vegan zero waste store in I think it was Missouri or something like that and I thought oh I said that's kind of unusual to open there and she said you'd just be surprised like you would think you know maybe that wouldn't be the best place to open a vegan zero waste shop but it, it was and you know people go through it and they either go there not if it's not because it's vegan it certainly it doesn't matter like you know despite the fact that even that it, it, it's vegan so I think it varies and then there's also Dallas um you know, Texas, I think, but then again, I don't know if the place is like, there's a, a place in Texas, in Dallas that I went to, because I, I ended up staying a few hours, um, and I, uh, on an interconnecting flight, and I went to a spiral diner, I think it's called, and like, you wouldn't think that like in the middle of, you know, Dallas, you know, Texas, you don't necessarily think of as being vegan friendly, although I believe different parts of Texas are, are more you know, vegan friendly than others, but this place was thriving and it was uh, amazing. So, and there's also a place in Australia um, that Rebecca Etridge runs, Wombat Cafe, and that's like way out, like in, you know, sort of suburban rural. Um, and it's a vegan cafe and it doesn't even have an online presence which I think is really interesting like it doesn't have a website it serves literally the locals or people that come into the area and it's like uh, I interviewed Beck recently and um, you know her business is just like you know being so successful so again it's either people come in either if it's not because of you know they don't care that it's um you know the vegan what i mean is the vegan aspect is certainly not hindering um the the sales so i think it's an interesting one but you know when you're starting a vegan business obviously you do need to do your research and find out what people want what will work and so for example if it's a food um, business if there's markets for example market stores are always a good way to trial a business uh, a food business get people to taste it get their feedback to find out if it's viable at uh, quite a low cost rather than rushing in and you know locking yourself into an you know a, a lease on a physical store for example so I think there are ways that you can kind of test test your market um you know before kind of going all in uh, and opening big places so definitely market research is important are there any vegan products that you know of that just didn't fly even with vegans Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know of any that, well, I guess because they didn't fly, we haven't really heard of them, but certainly the business owners that I've spoken to have, have said, you know, that they might have tried a particular flavor, for example. And yeah, it, you know, it, it just didn't kind of go down too well. Um, but I can't think of any off the top that, of my that, head that, just generally because most of them most of them will try something else. like you know if something didn't work or a particular flavor or it doesn't sell well then they'll just switch it out and they'll they'll try something different um so yeah so I, I love your answer though that if it didn't fly how would we know about it you know it reminds me when I lived in LA there was this fabulous museum in Hollywood called the Museum of Failure and it had like every <laughs> product even companies that are very successful like Nabisco with their Oreo and Coca-Cola's had flavors that just didn't fly and they had every failed product there it was quite interesting how funny <laughs> yeah I mean sometimes you do and at the end of the day sometimes you do just have to go for it so do as much research as possible and I think nowadays as well because because 
because you're not the only vegan cheese in town, for example, you know, you do have to have that point of difference. Um, even though there's still room, of course, in the market, if we look at how many dairy cheeses there are, for example, of course, there's there's room. But I think you've got to be a bit more innovative nowadays. Um, and but sometimes at the end of the day, yeah, you have got, just got to kind of go for it and test it and be willing to. I mean, we've heard the buzzword of the, you know, 2020, 21 is pivot. So, you know, be ready to pivot, be ready to be flexible. If one model, what I have heard as well when I've interviewed a lot of business owners is their business hasn't turned out the way they they initially planned, but they've pivoted and it's worked quite well. And I think COVID has had an impact on that. Like I've had, you know, businesses say that, uh, initially they were going to be planning to to run just as a, a regular restaurant but then covid has forced them to to open an on their online aspect and that's been really successful and they've actually moved more towards that business model so i think it's important to be flexible and to be willing to change where necessary rather than just kind of keep going keep going hope for the best i think you've always got to be looking at what's going on what the market is doing what people are saying, how they're buying, because how they're buying is different. For example, it more if more people are starting to buy online than are coming into your store, if you've got a physical store, for example, then you might want to put your resources into expanding that side of things. So I think you've always got to be nimble when you're you're running a business. And that's same for service providers as well. I know we've talked a lot about products and uh, and those kinds of things, but also service providers I think you've also got to be uh, quite nimble about and flexible about what what you're offering because sometimes what you're offering isn't what people want but they might tell you so well I don't want that but could you do this and you, you think about how you can be flexible in in doing that well, I think that's the secret in any kind of business honestly yeah yeah so what is vivas or vivas um yeah yeah it's vivas you did pronounce it right so um what it is, it's a it's a global community and media brand for vegan women, and it's to help them to become leaders in their life and their work. Um, so I started it at started it online as a, as a membership community when COVID hit um, and it's kind of grown from there. So we have regular virtual meetups for, for um, premium members and there's webinars and live webinars and training and resources. Um, and we have the front facing website, which has got lots of interesting stories, inspirational stories of vegan women. And there's also a podcast. This is my second podcast. So it's much newer. We're only into episode 33, which is called Conversations with Vegan Women leaders and we should have you on now that I'm thinking about it so we'll have to do a reciprocate where I, I have you on um, so yeah it's just a to, to really kind of support celebrate uh, vegan women uh, because you know I think there's a lot of general uh, sites and communities but I think sometimes there's something quite special about and it's open to everyone I should say when I say vegan women it's anyone who identifies um, as female um, and vegan uh, are welcome to join so people can join to just sign up for the newsletter and be updated about some of our free events and uh, the content that's there and then we've got a premium membership which helps to keep the network sustainable where we have the virtual meetups and the virtual meetups are great because people come together and share resources and lots of collaborations have happened from that um, I, I love to connect people so you know both within and outside of the network because like you you know I think our vegan networks are quite large so uh, it's a way for yeah to, to, to really help feel, for vegan women to feel very uplifted and supported. So yeah, that's what Vivas is, and that's the vivasnetwork.com is the website for that. Right. Well, it sounds like you're up to many, many wonderful things. And then we have everything you sent in the show notes, but is there a place you spend more, most of your time on social media if people wanted to get to know you a little bit better? Um, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. I am on Instagram. Um, as well but my I guess my favorite platforms it's not very popular to say it but I actually do like Facebook I don't like some of the dodgy stuff that they do but I like it as a platform um, to connect with people so even on my personal profile um, everything I post is public um, so you can find me on there and um, LinkedIn and Instagram I am on Twitter but again I don't really like it I think more conversation it's much easier to have conversations I think on Facebook and LinkedIn because you're not limited by the the characters but yeah you'll you'll see me quite a bit on social so so, yeah, look forward to connecting. You know, I was looking at your website and there was a book that sounded fascinating about a vegan, how to get on vegan podcasts. That sounds like an amazing book. 
Oh, it's not a, it's a directory. Um, so it's a friend of mine, Kathleen Gage, who created that. It's a podcast directory. So if you're someone, if you want to be interviewed um, or if you want to be a guest on a podcast show, um, then Kathleen's put together a whole list of vegan and plant-based podcasts. So it really saves you hours of work trying to, to find them and explains what each show is, what it's about. The host. So that's really good as well, because what I teach in my Vegans in the Limelight program is when you're pitching, uh, to be in a media outlet for example as a guest on a podcast show make sure you know what the show's about I get pitched a lot um, and I have guests even from publicists who say oh yes I've got this great guest for you and they can talk about um, you know or vegan business owner will say I can talk about the health benefits of gluten-free and I'm like it's a business show you know and I've got guidelines on my show like these are the guidelines and so I know when people have listened to the show and when they haven't so um, that's really helpful in the directory that Kathleen's put together um, and there's a link to that on vegan business media dot com um which you know if you're someone who wants to get yourself booked on ve particularly vegan and plant-based um shows that's a, a really handy resource so you can check it sounds that like out a great resource business. maybe you could add my show to it because i'm always looking for a wonderful vegan yeah if, yeah of course of course if it's not already in there i'm trying to think off the top of my head if it's not already in there i, I would if it's not, I, I'll make sure it get. I'll, I'll let Kathleen know to add it, of course. Thank you. It's so funny, Rudwana saying the only vegans I know in real life are on YouTube and Instagram. <laughs> funny. Oh, wonder where, where she lives. All right. Well, thank you. Kathleen. Oh, she's in um, Oregon. Oh, no, but uh, uh, one of the viewers, Rudwana, was saying that, oh. that, that uh, is she, the only vegans she knows are on YouTube and Instagram. Oh, <laughs> okay. Just <laughs> yes, no vegans. Oh, well. Well, gosh, thank you so much for everything you're doing. It's just been fascinating to hear about your different pies that you have all your different fingers in and yeah. all these, red. is she as beautiful in person as, as she looks on the screen yeah, she was very glamorous I mean I get it was very yeah uh, yeah it was very exciting to kind of see her her up close she was very regal as well very movie star so yeah even now <laughs> she looks amazing and I wonder, yeah. I wonder I wonder I'm guessing she's probably not vegan and she's probably not going to go vegan now I don't think so she, she no, must do something know. to take care of herself <laughs> yeah who knows <laughs> but it's we nice just, to see more people going going big and we'll get there we just got to keep chipping away doing what you do I mean you know you're incredible with what you do I love that you're spreading the the health side of it and you're a living example of that well, the health uh, side but I, but I came from the ethical side just so you know that's yeah what I, that was my point of entry and that is still my main impetus I just find a lot more people listen to the health because they yeah they got and something. it's brilliant I love however people get into it and I think you know whatever you're doing and even people who are watching and listening even if you haven't got your own shows or a big quote audience you know everything is a ripple effect so if you can take you know cupcakes again I'm going on there I'm not talking about anything healthy to work for example and people go oh you know uh, you know what I mean it's a ripple effect because when you go vegan yourself even if the people around you aren't doing it straight away or even criticizing you just you know keep doing what you do and you just never know and then by you going vegan or maybe posting about it that's going to encourage others then they will do it it's all a big ripple effect so uh, congratulations to everyone who's who's on this path or you know giving it a try and of course to you AJ and it's been so lovely Same doing here. this I, I really appreciate I, you I was on a show called Cupcake Wars and I didn't really want to go because it kind of compromised oh, yeah. my ethics I got to be vegan but I had to use oil and sugar and I was like oh, do I want to do this and Dr. Neil Barnard said to me yeah, bring them in with the cupcakes and then you hit them over the head with the kale. That's so true. And I think, is it Chef Chloe Coscarelli was on Cupcake Wars? And I think oh, she, she won. Oh, she which, won, yeah. Which she, was awesome. Brilliant. And there's actually a young woman, Freya Cox, who's on the Great British Bake Off at the moment. And she had a similar challenge. She, unfortunately, with the technical challenge, they forced you to use dairy and eggs, which was a shame. But, you know, she so she did that. And it's a shame. I've seen a lot of people criticise her and go, oh, you know, but, you know, she didn't have a choice with that but the fact is she's the first vegan on great british bake off all the other stuff she's making is completely vegan i think sometimes you know you've got to go for progress not perfection um you know so i think for her to be on that show and and spreading the vegan message and making amazing you know vegan um vegan items is is great and obviously they need to change the technical challenge to allow for that but they didn't this time but she she's still doing a good job bless her so yeah That's well thank you so much katrina it was a pleasure spending this hour with you. Thank you so much, AJ. Likewise. Thanks, everyone. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have two shows at very odd times, 7 a.m. Pacific and 6 p.m. Pacific, so that we can accommodate these wonderful raw vegan chefs from all across the globe. Take care, my Aussie friend. Bye-bye.